Hey everybody, and welcome back to Reflecting Shakespeare TV. My name is Erica. I'm a manager and facilitator with the Old Globe's Reflecting Shakespeare program, which is a transformative arts program that we bring to people experiencing incarceration. We're so glad you've joined us today. This program is designed to go inside while we cannot. If you are watching on social media and can help us tell our story of its impact and importance, can you take two minutes to click the link in the comments there and let us know? Thanks. So let's do this and bring on my co-host James and Nikki. Come on, you two. Hey, yes. Here we are back by popular demand. Nobody ever understands what I say when I say that. Anyway, hi everyone. My name is Nikki and I am bringing that reflecting Shakespeare right now with y'all. Thank you so much. Yes. Hello, Nikki. Hi everyone. My name is James. I am also a facilitator here on the Reflecting Shakespeare program at the Old Globe Theatre. But now, let us welcome back our guest into our VIP suite, back by popular demand. Everyone Absolutely. say hello to Haisan. Yes. Hey, what's up, everybody? How's everybody Hi, doing? Son. Yes. Hey, hi, Sam. What's up, brother? Can you do me a favor? Can you just yeah. remind some folks and let any new folks know who you are, please, man? Absolutely, James. Hello, everyone. My name's Haisan. I'm freezing up here in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> I served just over 24 years in three installments uh, in Wisconsin prison system, including 17 and a half years straight. I'm married now to the most amazing woman. I've been out for eight years, um, and we have an amazing pack of dogs and cats, including Brutus, Cassius, Lucius, Ariel, Desdemona, Juliet, and Katie. Since March, mm -hmm. First, I have passed my safety MLO. I'm a now a licensed mortgage loan originator, <clears throat> and I received my uh, bachelor's degree in uh, business administration and marketing. And I've been accepted into graduate school where I'll be pursuing my master's, excuse me, my master's of business administration, and then subsequent to that, my master's of leadership and management. Ooh. All right, man, you are busy, busy, busy. I'm going to be yeah. applying to him for a job. <laughs> yeah, right. He's the man. Thank you. Hi, son. That's beautiful. All right. So for those of you watching, um, let's think about this. Um, we're going to ask you to do some journaling as we're working today. So we invite you right now, if you can, to get something to write with. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's slay this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, check-ins for the week. What were your challenges and triumphs? Folks watching, this is where we will always start. All right, let's get this going. I'll start. So my low this week is nothing. I have not one low. I have nothing, nothing low, nothing dragging me down, no mental things dragging me down. So, and my high is I have been able to get a membership at a gym. I was able to work out and I realized how much my body and my mind needed it. So I am super pumped doing cartwheels through life right now. What about you, Haisan? Well, I mean, I have had a couple of those. I love your attitude and I, I want to adopt it. I had a couple of things happen with regard to my background, but when you're pursuing um, certain levels of employment, you face that. And that's part of the consequences of my kind, even if 30 years ago, and I accept that. Um, and the positive thing is that in the direction moving forward, I've found a way to kind of remove that and just do a lot of independent work. And that's what I'm going to be pursuing. Nice. Thank you. Hi, son. All right. Um, my low is, uh, I really miss the sea. I really miss the ocean, which is ridiculous because I live in San Diego, San Diego, right? So I just got to remind myself to take a breath, take a pause, and just go to the ocean, right? Go to the ocean, stick my feet in the sea for a little bit, and get just connected. The sea kind of connects me somehow to the rest of the planet. I don't know how that works, but it does. My high is I've been really listening to music, and I've been letting music do what music does, which is transport me to different places different times to different people, even different moods and emotions. So I've been diving into that experience. All right, Eric, what about you? Well, I guess my low this week has kind of been the hamster on the, on the wheel kind of thing in terms of work. I've been go, 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 and feeling like I really, really need a break. 
my eye this week has been visualizing that break, what that's going to look like. <laughs> and when we signed on today, uh, I was talking about oh. that with Hassan and, and he really encouraged me not to burn out. So my highlight is also that, um, that word of encouragement, you know, I really appreciate this circle. So for you watching, what were your challenges and triumphs, lows and highs this week? That's a great warm up check in to get you going as we start this work. All right, all right, all right. So let's move into this week's warm up. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the group who is assembled on screen today, those of you who might be tuning in to us. And you know what? I was thinking about how powerful we can be. And I was thinking about superheroes and superpowers, right? So our warm up this week is my superpower is. So those of you watching, those of us on screen, take a second to think about one quality that you have. One thing that you can really dig into and maybe give out to the world. Think about that thing. Think about a pose, right, that might sum that up. You see those statues. We think about Superman, superheroes, uh, all of that stuff, what they look like. Think about that just for a second. When you've got one, we're going to put these into action. And it's going to go like this. I'm going to say my name is, so my name is James, and my superpower is, I'm going to give that a name. I'm going to give that a pose. We'll take a breath. And then you're going to repeat back to me what I did. We're going to move around the room like that. All right. So here we go. My name is James. And my superpower is listening. My, my name, name is James. James. And, and my, my superpower is, is listening. listening. All right. My name is Nikki, and my superpower is gratitude. Mm. My, name my name is, is Nikki, and, and my, my superpower, superpower is gratitude. gratitude. All right. My name is Hassan, and my superpower is perception. My name, my name is Hassan. And my, and my superpower, superpower is, is perception. perception. My name is Erica, and my superpower is integrity. My name, my is, name Erica. is Erica, and, and my superpower, superpower is, is integrity. integrity. All right, everyone watching, what are your superpowers? Let's hear them and let's see them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Thank you for joining in with Thank us. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks everybody for participating in that warm up game. Warm ups are not just silly, funny ways to loosen up our instruments, which is our whole selves. Warm ups uh, that incorporate the total instrument give us an opportunity to move, to speak, and to react intentionally. And it helps us ease into the process of translating our individual script, scene, or scene development. Uh, to the collective process and product. All right, well, now that we've warmed up our sense of play, and I also want to say with that particular warm up, warming up our, our sense of allowing ourselves to feel good about ourselves, which I mm. love about that warm up. Bam, that's hard for many, right? So let's get into our work. For this um, series of Reflecting Shakespeare TV, you got to know by now we're looking at much ado about nothing Shakespeare's comedy that has a lot of a lot of tragedy and drama in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah. So as always, our goal is to have fun with the story to relish be extra as our students in juvenile hall say with when we're working out this script, digging into the characters and the situations, but also and very importantly then relating it back to us in the here and now with our own personal experience and our own personal perspectives. That's really what we wanna use the play as a trampoline to jump into. So, all right, folks, set up this story. All right, so let's get into this uh, comedy thing here. So, well, we're headed into the fourth quarter. It's the last inning, right? There's hope on the horizon. 
we're beginning to wrap up the story. So a whole lot has gone on, like a whole lot, people, like way too much has gone on. So the beautiful young daughter of the house, which is Hero, right, was jilted at the altar by Claudio. Not only jilted, but like completely, like just undone, undone. She was slandered, she was shamed, and and then, I mean, a million other things happened to her, right? But Claudio was the one that was also undone because shortly after he took down the love of his life, he and everyone else learned that he was motivated by a false narrative about Hero, designed by Don John and his cronies, a handful of men thriving on chaos. And mm -hmm. we all know folks thriving on chaos and what kind of destruction that creates. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nikki. Man, you're all right. A lot has gone on in this story. So the other couple in the story, Beatrice and Benedict, after jabbing at each other for hours and years, right, have also fallen into a plot. But they fall into a plot which is motivated by love and harmony. So Don Pedro set it up that each would overhear that the other loved them. And as planned, this led them to both realizing that they did, after all this time, all those words, indeed do love each other. They've even declared their love. But as part of that, Beatrice asked Benedict to avenge Hero's downfall and to kill Claudio. And Benedict has challenged Claudio to a duel. Oh, wait, wait. There's a stall tactic in place that may save us from this duel. At the altar, Hero collapsed, and the priest suggested that the whole family hide Hero away and claim that she is dead. That might give time for repentance and investigation. Maybe the truth will come out about Hero's innocence. And well, in the last scene we saw, we heard Don John's follower, Baracchio, confess his part in the false plot that took down Hero. So some people know she's innocent, the one that heard that confession. But at this moment in the play, Claudio still believes her to be dead. Hero's father, Leonardo, is not done with the plotting. He has his own scheme for taking care of Claudio and leading to the reveal that Hero is still alive. All right, so let's get into the scene. Haisan will play Leonardo, James will play Claudio, and Nikki is going to play Don Pedro. I thank you, princess, for my daughter's death. Recorded with your high and worthy deeds, twas bravely done. If you bethink you of it. I know not how to pray your patience. Yet I must speak. Choose your revenge yourself. Impose me to what penance your invention can lay upon my sin. Yet sin I not, but in mistaking. By my soul, nor I. And yet to satisfy this good old man, I would bend under any heavy weight that he'll enjoin me to. I cannot bid you bid my daughter live. That were impossible, but I pray you both possess the people in Messina here how innocent she died. And if your love can labor aught in sad intervention, hang her an epitaph upon her tomb and sing to it her bones. Sing it tonight, tomorrow morning. Come you by my house. And since you could not be my son-in-law, be yet my nephew. My brother hath a daughter, almost a copy of my child that's dead, and she alone is heir to both of us. Give her the right you should have given her cousin, and so dies my revenge. Oh, noble sir, your overkindness doth wring tears from me. I do embrace your offer and dispose forth henceforth of poor Claudio. Tomorrow, then, I will expect your coming. Tonight, I take my leave. And till tomorrow morning, lords, farewell. We will not fail. Tonight, I'll mourn with Hero. Yes! Awesome! That was great. We're going to move on to the next scene before we discuss it. So... Now we get to the scene that follows. We see Benedict and Beatrice, who don't yet know about Baracchio's confession. And Hassan will play Benedict, and he's trying to be the lover he never was. And Nikki will play Beatrice, who wants to know how Benedict got on with challenging and killing his friend Claudio, as Beatrice asked of him. And I'll come out later as Beatrice and Hero's ladies' maid, Margaret. <laughs> Sits about and knows me, and knows me. A pitiful, I deserve thee. I 
mean, and singing, but loving. Leander the Good Swimmer, Troilus, the first employer of Panders, why they were never so truly turned over and over as poor as myself in love. Mary, I, I cannot shorten rhyme, I have tried. I can find out no rhyme to lady, but baby? An innocent rhyme for scorn, a horn, oh, a hard rhyme for school fool, a babbling rhyme. Very ominous endings, no, I was not born under a rhyming planet, nor can I woo in festival terms. Sweet Beatrice, wouldst thou come when I called thee? Yea, senor, and depart when you bid me. Oh, stay but till then. Then is spoken, fare you well now, and yet ere I go, let me go with that I came, which is with knowing what hath passed between you and Claudio. Only foul words. And thereupon I will kiss thee. Foul words is but foul wind, and foul wind is but foul breath, and foul breath is nonsense. Therefore I will depart unkissed. Thou hast frighted the word out of his right sense, so forcibly is thy wit. But I must tell thee plainly, Claudio undergoes my challenge, and either I must shortly hear from him, or I will subscribe him a coward. And I pray thee now, tell me which of my bad parts is thou first fall in love with me? For them all together, which maintains so politic a state of evil that they will not admit any good part to intermingle with them. But for which of my good parts did you first suffer love for me? Suffer love? A good epithet. I do suffer love indeed, for I love thee against my will. In spite of your heart? I think, alas, poor heart. If you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours. For I will never love that which my friend hates. Thou and I are too wise to woo peace. And now tell me, how doth your cousin? Very ill. And how do you? Very ill too. Serve God, love me, and mend. There I will leave you too. For here comes one in haste. You must come to your uncle, yonder's old coil at home. It is proved my lady hero hath been falsely accused. The prince and Claudio mightily abused, and Don John is the author of it all, who is fled and gone. Will you come presently? Will you go hear this news, senor? I will live in thy heart, die in thy lap, and be buried in thy eyes, and moreover, I will go to thee thy uncles. Yes! Woo! Fire! Fire. And woo! Yes, yes, yes. Great job. Right. Okay, so let's just unpack those two scenes and make sure we know just the plot. What happened? What'd you get from them? Okay, here's what's going down. Leonardo's plan for Claudio to make right of his wrong is to marry another young lady in Leonardo's family, a daughter of his brother. Leonardo says that she looks like Hero and is now the heir to the family fortune. So Claudio agrees. He sees it as a way to make right of his wrongs. And that marriage is going to happen tomorrow morning. <laughs> as for Beatrice and Benedict, we get to see how they interact now that they have admitted their love for each other. And you all heard that Benedict cannot sing or rhyme. No, he can't. But Beatrice comes in and wants to know, what's the deal with Claudio? Rhyming don't matter. What's up with Claudio? And did Benedict, and Benedict says that he's challenged him. He's done his part. And then Margaret comes in and catches everybody up on the plot that all the other characters in the audience knows already and says, let's leave the stage and go over to Leonardo's and check it out. Go to the front room. And the one thing that um, we didn't mention is, is that Leonardo is also, with the marriage being tomorrow, suggests to Claudio that Claudio tonight mm. um, go sing. and sing a man's, mm. sing his penitence over yes. Hero's tomb. All right, so... Two big scenes. Let's start with thinking about Leonardo's plan in terms of your takeaways or what are, you, what are you thinking about all of this? At this point, the audience though really is, they can see the formulation of a plan, but not quite what the end game is. Which right. is nice because the audience is really clued in, but there's still some surprises there. It's like, what is this plan of Leonardo's? I don't really see it. And um, it is a weird plan, right? I mean, in, in modern context, Claudio asked for revenge for a revenge of Leonardo's and the revenge is marry into my family. <laughs> just right. get, my, get my niece off my hands. Uh, I'm just going to say something about not on Claudio's behalf, but kind of like 
like he shows up in this play like having been to war but he's naive pretty much about everything <laughs> and this is not giving him the pass but i feel like at this moment he's just going sure you want me to do that to try and make it somewhat better than it was even though it's awful i will i will do what you're asking me like i'm not gonna i'm just gonna do that maybe though the gravitas of who leonardo is would maybe in Claudio's naivete that the way he suggested seems like this is normal and I should just because if I didn't fall I I would seem to be a rube at that point you know maybe he's like uh, pressured by some sense of uh, uh, obligation that he has assigned to himself that doesn't really exist right right yeah I think that's the one thing that stands really out to me too it's like so Claudio is it seems like he's adamant to make it right and whatever right looks like, you know, and he's, he's opened the door and and taking suggestions so much. So the thing that blows my mind is because Claudio and Hero were so much in love in the background, in the beginning of the story. And it's like, when you think about love and what you're willing to do for it. Right. And then to know that he's the, he's the captor that destroyed that, you know, he's the one that ruined that. And so now he's looking to her father for some type of relief so that he can, you know, make some type of penance, but it's the, at the same time too, it's like what he's willing to do to make it right in that element. It just kind of, it kind of baffles me a little bit because then yeah. I think, wow, what are we willing to do to, to, to make it right, to make things right? I don't think, I don't think he, I really think he doesn't know. I think he really doesn't know. So he's like that suggestion. I'll give that a go. Sure. But he doesn't know how to process it really or how to absorb it or even go really know how do you tackle, how, do, how does he tackle what's next? I don't think he knows. What I hear and what you were saying just now, Nikki, is is the implicit uh, love betrayal in the agreeing to marry someone else as, a, as an amends to what he did to the love of his life. And, and what I think is that actually Claudio and Hero may have been, it may be an, an exception of being people of status marrying for love as opposed to marrying for more of a financial transaction. And so sure. like his marriage with Hero would have been this unusual, we've fallen in love and these households right. can unite. And this oh. other thing is more of that typical like set up marriage, these two houses will will join and it's it's like, that that yes. marriage as a business transaction was a very common situation. Yeah, it's a they would have been would have been if they're the status that we think they are in the play, they would have had an arranged marriage pretty much for sure. Oh you yeah, know? families of status. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that still happens. Frankly, but yes, I mean, you know, he does Claudio doesn't say, you're right, Nikki, Claudio doesn't say but how could I do that? And how could I do that tomorrow? You know, he's just exactly what you said, you know, bends to Leonardo as a way to, as a way to make amends to that family, you know, and Uh, yeah, lucky for everyone, Claudio is super open to suggestion. Yeah. But he is, as Haisam was pointing out, he's looking, he's certainly looking at to these people who are above him in this hierarchy here. Right. And he sees Leonardo as Haisam rightly said, Here's this guy, he's uh, a lord, all of that stuff. And he puts this suggestion forwards and Claudio doesn't know what to do. So he hears that, knows probably in this system that, man, I've done this guy a real wrong here and her. He's suggesting a solution. I'll take it. All right. So what do we think about this scene with Beatrice and Benedict? Oh, <laughs> I love it. The the banter and the the back and forth, the the, the honesty and then the shifts of uh because I think that they have like this ADHD type of relationship where they're they're weaving in and out of conflict, love, uh resolution, that that whole cycle of the honeymoon, you know. Um, but the 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 the, the exchange is so interesting and, and especially with the amount of honesty that takes place in there. Yeah, I think Shakespeare's reminding us it's a comedy, right? He we get this com- we get this comic bad singing. But on a on a takeaway note, there's a transformation in Benedict where he's he's allowing himself to be vulnerable. In this case, he's it's 
it's directly with the audience. He would be out there alone. All of his statements, you know, a lot of people say he's talking to himself. He's not talking to himself. He's talking to every, all those human beings there that he can see and, and relate to. They're the audience and, and they see how much he's changed and they see he's trying hard and can't sing and can't rhyme and there's no hiding from it. There's no hiding from it. And so he's just out there with it. And that's such a beautiful, that in a way we get also that lesson about becoming vulnerable. That there's strength in that vulnerability as well. I was, it's, yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's, it's if it's intentional or not, but I think the way I always like bring things in and know that I, I got stronger as a person when I let myself be vulnerable to some processes and some, uh, 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 opportunities rather than uh, uh, seeking, you know, the comfort level of resistance and, you know, isolation to be vulnerable, to open up, to, to grow, you know, and, and while it may not be specifically what the intent is, the symbolism is definitely recognized from someone who's been through that process mm. and continues in that process. <laughs> <laughs> I was really thinking about what we've learned about their relationship. And even though, there's been like this seismic shift in their relationship. Like they've admitted their love for each other. Their pattern of back and forth is still that, that back and forth of layering over each other, throwing one to the other, the other one catches it and throws it back. But it comes from a slightly different yet gigantically different place. Mm -hmm. Right. But there they are. Like they still get into their routine with each other, but that, there's this, that's, there's that's this change. That's just right. what they do. <laughs> right. Right. One thing I like about this part is with, you know, like we've gone back and forth with their relationship and where they are and how they stand and um, how it came about, you know, the friction that ultimately created the fire, right, for both of them to be honest with each other about where they're at in their relationship. But the one thing that I can appreciate that speaks louder, and I think it speaks volumes, is because, you know, Beatrice is going through something like so horrific right now she's saying how she's ill her cousin is ill nothing is right you know and she's in motion like she's got that go get them mentality right now to just try and get things done in her space you know seems a little just discombobulated but yet when she runs into him she stops and she takes the time to have a conversation with him and time is priceless you know, especially when you have so much going on in your life and you take an opportunity to just sit down and, and, and even if it's to, to tap back and forth, I think a lot of times we just dismiss that in our lives where, you know, it's, uh, and that's why I find it so valuable when we're having interactions with people is because no matter what that interaction is, somebody is giving you their time. Mm. You cannot get that back. That is a priceless priceless thing that somebody has just given you, you know, and um, of course, I always like to put a positive spin on it. But the one thing that I love is, you know, as they're as they're having this interaction, and as they're going back and forth with this, I appreciate how you guys said the vulnerability component of it, because things only can escalate in growth and, 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 and root of depth when it comes to vulnerability, I absolutely concur. And the one thing I like is how they, they get to the point in here where it's like, they have that moment about, well, why do you love me? Well, you tell me why you love me. You know, let's, let's talk, let's take one minute out of all of this chaos right now. <laughs> just tell each other, why do we love each other? Yes, exactly. And I think that that's, that's the beauty in it. Like, regardless of what's going on, let's bring it back for a second. Let's acknowledge that love, acknowledge that I'm giving you this time and this space. And then I love how Benedict at the end, he's basically yes. saying, just make it right. You know, serve God, love me and men. And so it's like, you know, sir, so look up, you know, look up to that holy being or whatever it might be. Love me because I'm going to be here. I love you and let us heal. And I love that. I love I love it just came together beautifully. And I, uh, what was so awesome is that after those heartfelt, really intimate moments, they have to regress or if, yeah, regress back to the, the, the nexus of their relationship, which is, you know, I, I will love thee in thy heart die in thy lap and be buried in thy eyes and then it's it shifts as erica pointed out earlier to the okay and moreover i will leave thy uncles you know uh now, okay that's out of the way now let's get back to this you know what we got going on here and it shift yeah there's something very in the writing there's something very truthful and in fact believable i think about their relationship 
you know, that it's gone through like, kind of, I don't know, for me, like a kind of really recognizable pattern. Uh, I think there's a lot of Beatrice and Benedicts out there in different combinations for sure. Oh yeah. Hey, thanks for sticking with us guys. Don't forget about the opportunity to have your voice heard and help keep this kind of programming alive and thriving and ever improving by clicking the link in the comments and letting us know about your experience watching. Two thumbs up. We'll take them. Thanks. All right. So here we go, people, into the quick right. So Benedict is open about his feelings expressing his vulnerability in love. In his rhyming, which we heard was outstanding, Haisan, just by the way. Oh, okay. And in his musical talents, which are far exceeding everybody's standards, high five for that. And yet, though, he pursues it openly with an audience full of people, allowing himself to be vulnerable, expressing and screaming at the rooftops this love and his feelings and his emotions, right? So how do you all feel about vulnerability? This leads us right into the quick right. I perceive vulnerability as vulnerability makes me feel when I consider expressing vulnerability, I sometimes, or usually, when I mask vulnerability, an outcome has been when I received vulnerability and someone was vulnerable to me, it made me feel and a positive outcome of expressing vulnerability has been or might be. We'll repeat the writing prompt on the screen at the end of the program if you didn't have enough time to write it down. All right, so it is that night now where we get to the scene and we are at Hero's grave where Leonardo told Claudio he should offer penitence. And many productions will place the actress playing Hero somewhere on stage listening in so that Hero can witness this. Um, in a recent production at Shakespeare's Globe, we saw the actress playing Hero like lying like a statue on top of the grave. So actually Claudio is kneeling right above her in a famous production in New York from a couple of years ago. She was up on a balcony nearby. So just giving everyone the thought that we're at this graveside, but possibly, possibly Hero is listening and depending on the staging. So Haisan will play Claudio and James will play Friar Francis. Is this the grave of hero? It is, my lord. Done to death by slanderous tongues was the hero that here lies. Death and guerdon of her wrongs give her fame which never dies. Now, music, sound, and sing your solemn hymn. Pardoned, goddess of the night that slew thy virgin knight, for the witch with songs of woe round about her tomb they go. Midnight, assist our moan, help us to sigh and groan, heavily, heavily. Graves yawn and yield your dead, till death be uttered, heavily, heavily. So the life that died with shame lives in death with glorious fame. Hang thou there upon the tomb, praising her when I am dumb. Now, upon thy bones, good night, yearly will I do this right. Beautiful, Hassan. That was really beautiful. So while we're in that mist of beauty and imagining Claudio leaving his love there for dead, um, just unpack, like, what having read that, what, what happened in that scene? It, it really feels like he's reconciled himself with the gravity of what he's done. And the, I would hope that part of that reconciliation was how suggestible and how malleable he had been, how much he was not in charge, but more or less guided through um, action rather than being the initiator. 
and that reconciliation has to prompt some for me acknowledging that or seeing that it prompts thinking of you know how one of the ways that people offend is by suggestibility and being um drawn into criminal activity drawn into anything that you don't necessarily want to be drawn into because sometimes one doesn't have the voice to say no and sometimes one believes that others are so much po more powerful than you that no is not an option um and then to nevertheless once you realize or once the realization is that one has been subject to suggestibility or been uh uh suggestible and and, and it doesn't take away the responsibility. It doesn't take away the, the accountability that has to come uh, just because you didn't mean for the consequence, um, for the result, excuse me, you didn't intend for the result. That doesn't take away the, the, the action and the truth of the matter. And, and while I think everyone that perhaps has pulled a trigger or, or made a move didn't intend for the end result to be there, it doesn't take away that responsibility. And I think at this point, especially I think when he says yearly, will I do this right? He's owning that in perpetuity. He's saying, you know, I effed up, but I own it and I can't do much, but I'm going to give you at least the respect of showing up here every year and paying my respects. I think that's so beautiful, Haisan, how you speak to his genuine penitence and remorse, especially with the commitment on that last line, that this is like the beginning of a yearly process and it's, it's on, it's going to be ongoing. It's going to be lifelong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think an audience may be looking at this moment, wondering if it's, if it's enough or, you know, having, depending on which characters they really connected with. I don't know. What do you think about that? But if this is the penitent scene, how do we all feel about that? I, if I could speak, I am, uh, I just recently have dealt with uh, I, what I could, okay, we commit a crime, we're given a sentence, we serve our sentence, and then we move on with life. But that's not always the case. Um, I just recently was denied a great opportunity based on something I did 30 years ago. And is that penitence enough to, you know, punish a 50 year old man for his 20 year old self? I don't know. What I do know is that um, we have to balance society as a society have to balance what we expect as by way of punishment and what we expect by way of reformation and not let the part of punishment inhibit the rehabilitation or the, the, the reformation because it's, it, it, it loses uh, uh, weight to, to, to uh, incarcerate a person as a form of punishment and say, we want you to move forward uh, uh, and, and sin no more, if you will. And then when, as one tries to progress and get to levels of development and maturity and growth and expansion, um, hit these roadblocks because 30 years ago, you were this person. Um, so we have to, as a community, as society, as human beings juxtapose penitence with what is common sense. It's hard to it's hard to just encapsulate the when when like when you really start to accept everything, how many multitudes of way ways that that what I did has affected so many people. Um, and I'm not talking about like because I don't got as convinced the parole board anymore. I'm done with that. You know, I'm talking about like I'm 50 years old. I'm being accountable to things in my life and. That that record that that recognizing and understanding like I it, it's way beyond something I can see uh, firsthand and that it goes beyond you know I don't know you know as it relates to penitence if one can ever really be penitent for affecting someone's life in perpetuity. You know I think a lot of the viewers of this program are are in a process to one degree or another of the possibility of going before a parole board, being rejected by a parole board, being accepted by a parole board, looking forward to a date when they'll have the opportunity to go to a parole board or looking at a sentence where they don't have that opportunity at all. And I'm wondering if we are able to have this conversation about Claudio expressing his penitence and maybe internally wondering if it's enough in that context. I think that's the way, unfortunately, um, 
that it will always be wondering, is it ever going to be enough? Right. And I think, you know, as he's there and as he's at her gravesite, one that in it and of itself is a lot. Um, I think when we think about the accountability component, we think about penitence, we think about making amends, right? There's so many different avenues that we can go to. And I, I appreciate how you said, Erica, there's so many of our folks that are writing right now, waiting, I mean, to get ready to go to the board. They've been to the board, they've been rejected, you know, and doing that internal reflection and figuring out what is it, right? What does the board want? They want insight. They want, they want remorse, they want you to understand the what you've done, the impact that you've had by your actions, right? And I think Claudio is in a position right now to where it's resonating with him. You know, it's really resonating with him. And he's having this opportunity in person to sit there and say how hurt he is. And being accountable, Haisan, is, I love how you said it also earlier, accountability is key, right? And if we can, whether somebody encouraged us whether somebody pushed us, whether somebody influenced us, we have to get to the point to where we can actually be accountable. What was my part? What did I do? Regardless if they pushed me, influenced me, paid me, encouraged me, pumped me up, what did I do? What was my role? There's a million things that we can do with every single one of our actions. A million, a million choices that we could take, you know? Um, I think the accountability component is just so key. And I think once we end up getting to that point, for some reason, inside of our psyche, inside of our nature, inside of our core, something shifts and allows us an experience and an opportunity to cultivate something different because we don't never want to do that again. Mm -hmm. We don't never want to feel that open. We come to the realization of the harm and the damage that we caused and just like Kaisan said, not to just only our immediate victims, but all of our victims and how we have to sit in that accountability, you know, and how do we measure penitence? We can't, right? But what we can do, what we have the ability to do is live every single day, whether it be living amends, making amends, doing them indirect amends. We have the capacity to cultivate a character right? That is no longer the person that ultimately created that harm in the first place. And that's the key. And it doesn't matter how many times we go to the board, it hurts. And it, and I mean, it eventually it does matter, but ultimately what matters more than anything is that we have to live with ourselves right? and living with ourselves and knowing what we've done. If we can get to the point where we've hit accountability, we get to the point where we can make amends. Ultimately we can heal. And that in and of itself is more powerful. It's more impactful. And it, it, it's, a, it's a reparation that we need for ourselves also to, in a way, to honor our victims to the best we possibly can. Of course, I want all of our folks to go in there and go to board and get found suitable and get a date. But really, in all actuality, I want you to heal first. Because nobody wants to walk around with the reality of the harm that we cause because that deteriorates our soul and it makes us incompetent and incapable of being the best version of ourselves. And when we do that, we only create more harm. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. You know, and I think with that, with the penitence, it's like, you know, as we were talking earlier, there's so many things externally that are there to beat us up, to tear us down to remind us of what it is that we've done and who it is that we were, right? But it's up to us to be able to have that internal lock on ourselves for the next steps, you know? And I think, I think when we get to those points, that's, it's ultimately what makes us so resilient that any knockdown at this point, it's nothing, it's nothing. It's going it, to, it's going to help me be better. Well, thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that. Guess what? I know that I'm better than that. I, I know that that's not who I am. And this is what's getting ready to come. So I, for Haisan, I can only imagine, let that door close, baby, because they're getting ready to be floodgates that are opening and doors. They're going to not have a little door to open. This gonna, they're going to have to pull the door like this. Here he comes. Well, here I come then. Here I come. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to just because real I, I noticed Claudio got to that without see 
not every action is accountable before a judge or a parole commission. He did that. That was his process. Now, I don't know if it was out of desire to just cleanse oneself of a, a foul deed or perceived foul deed, or, or if that's just where he was at his maturity to say, hey, my bad, I'm going to do right after this. But he did that without anyone uh, calling him to account. He did that on his own. Just thinking that's a beautiful point. Leonardo suggested it, but all the words were Claudio's. Right. And, and, and that's the real measure, I think, across the board, because I never had a successful parole hearing. You know, um, and, and many of us, most success, most parole hearings don't result in a parole. So we got to do this for the day to day. I got to be able to look in the mirror um, type stuff more than more than to uh, uh, seek the validation of someone else, because it's my process, your process, our process. And no one can measure, weigh or validate um, my internal process to the satisfaction or to a level of satisfaction that meets them because it's about me. That was amazing conversation. Amazing. So with that, that leads us into our reflection question. I know it's a little deep and I know it's a little heavy. So thank you all for sticking with us and being willing to participate in something of value in treating yourself. So with that, we come to our reflection question. When we need to make things right with somebody, sometimes we wait until it's too late. Why do we let our fears, ego, and masks prevent us from making amends? And what does penitence look like for you? We'll repeat the prompts on the screen at the end of the program if you didn't get enough time to write it all down. Whew. Well, guess what, guys? It is that time. It is the end of the episode. Ooh. That was deep, and I didn't even bring a shovel to the scene. <laughs> oh, check it out. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's how we do it. That's oh, how we do it, y'all. Right? Oh, I'm so glad oh, to yes. have this crew together to have these yes. conversations. Mm. This is awesome. Thank you. So look, if you've made it all the way to the end of this episode, you are a dedicated viewer and your input is truly valued. So thank you. Let us know about your journey to this point in the program by clicking that link in the comments. All right. Wow. I had to catch up for a second there. There's a lot. There's a lot to digest, a lot to think about. A lot of thoughts and words to be really grateful for this episode for me, for sure. So we're going to end our class the way we uh, end when we can work in person. Those of you who've been watching for a while, you know what's coming up already. So we're going to do our one word checkout. And that is one word describing how we're feeling right now at the end of this Time together. Nikki, can you start us off? Absolutely. Oh. oh. <laughs> I'm going to go with all. A W E. <laughs> all right. I'm going to go with yeah. <laughs> all these expressive words. I'm going with connected which in the language we've been doing is mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and everyone watching awesome thank you guys so much all right and so right now what we'll do is we'll count one two three and then we clap on the fourth beat together send y'all out with some greatness ready one two three i love it ah, thank you all right everyone thank you for visiting with us today thank you for having me guys see y'all take, take care everyone everyone watching bye, -bye.